So would you stand with me one more time and uh, let's pray again. Father, we want to thank you again for the awesome privilege that you give to us to be able to gather together openly and freely to worship you, to celebrate you, to study your word. Lord, you've commanded us not to forsake the gathering together of believers, and we thank you that we have this place to come to, to seek your face, Lord, knowing that you'll be found, to be able to pray for one another, to encourage one another. Father, we thank you for the privilege of worship, just to sing your praises. And Lord, we thank you that you've prepared our hearts to receive from your word. Tonight, Lord, we ask that you would teach us all things by your Holy Spirit. We're thankful that you know each and every one of us. You know our needs, our desires, our wants, our hopes. And Lord, we know that you can meet those according to your will and according to your purposes. So we want to give you this time, Lord, that we might bring honor to you with the things we say and the things we do. And we ask all these things now in Jesus' most holy and precious name. And all of God's people who agreed said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. And uh, we're going to continue our study in personal evangelism. I can't even say it anymore. Personal evangelism. And uh, we're at section four. There was another video that was posted following one. And there's going to be another video posted tomorrow following this fourth one. So actually, all together, we'll have had six sessions just to encourage you and hopefully give you some tools to be able to go out and share your faith with the rest of the world. But we know we should win souls. That was our first session. We talked a little bit about why we don't win souls, pride, lethargy, and that kind of thing. And we've asked for power to be a witness. That was our third session. But tonight I, I want to say that there's one more thing that we need. We need a burden. We need a passion for souls. If I don't have that burden, if I don't have that passion, a lot of times I just don't go witness because I don't feel like it. Or maybe there's something good on TV and I, I just don't go. You know, and anyone can have a pocket full of tracks and you could have studied evangelism and that's good intention but what is it that gets you going? What is it that gets you up and gets you out there? Well, one, it's the power of the Spirit. But two, I want to suggest that we need to pray for a burden for the lost. Because sometimes we don't seem to have that. Uh, you know, so your method of evangelism oftentimes will depend upon uh, your personality and the place that you're at. And I talk all about that in the, in the uh, study on methods of evangelism. That's the one that will be posted tomorrow. But there are all kinds of clever things you can do to evangelize. Um, I have heard some crazy things over the years, and one of them was a guy down in Los Angeles. He got a big six-foot stepladder, and he put it on a busy corner at lunchtime, and he would just sit there and do this. And people started laughing at him. And people started mocking him. Hey, what are you doing? What are you, crazy? What do you think you're doing? He said, I'm fishing. Oh, then it went wild. Oh, what are you catching? Anything? <clears throat> then when a good crowd was gathered, he said, I'm fishing for men. And he preached the gospel. It worked. This guy was a fun guy. He, he would do anything. He got a friend that he was trying to teach how to evangelize. I'm going to take you out with me. I want to show you what we do. Go out in the street and preach to people. And the guy said, well, I want to learn. I'll go with you. Brand new believer. And he said, okay, what we're going to do on the street today is um, I want you to start preaching. And he goes, I, well, I've never done that. He goes, I know, it's okay. Just share a scripture. You know, God so loved the world. You start preaching. I'm going to start heckling you because people love to hear some kind of argument. And we'll gather a crowd. Once the crowd gathers, I'll take over and I'll share the gospel, but you'll help me gather the crowd. And the guy goes, okay, I'll do it. So he starts in and he goes, well, for God so loved the world. And this guy goes, how do you know? You know? Well, he loved the world so much that he gave, hey, is there even really a God? And, and sure enough, a crowd starts gathering, people start coming. And this uh, more seasoned evangelist, I'll say, was ready to take over. And, and just before he was ready to step up, a big guy, a really big guy, grabbed him and drug him down the alley. And, and he goes, you leave that little guy alone. He's doing the best he can. He ain't very good, but he's doing the best he can. So... You know, we really want to seek the Lord about how we evangelize, but he got to see a lot of people come to the Lord. A lot of fun, you know. 
But uh, we need compassion for souls, a burden for the lost. And that comes from close communion with Jesus Christ. Now, I want to be like Jesus. I know you do too. And that's why you're here. You want to learn more about the Lord. You want to learn more about his word. I want there to be less of me and more of him. It's like uh, John the Baptist said, I want to decrease that he might increase. And uh, Corinthians, excuse me, says that we're changed from glory to glory into his image. I want to look more like him. I want to be more like him. And so we're going to talk about the compassion that Jesus had, the heart of Jesus. And we're going to see too tonight that Paul had that same kind of compassion, that same kind of drive. Now, one of my favorite stories out of the Old Testament, and I have a lot of them that are favorite, but one of them is found in, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 20. You may recall that Jeremiah was called by God to minister to the people of Judah, especially the people of Jerusalem. Now, when he first began his ministry, he was very young, and there was a revival in the land. There was a king named Josiah. Josiah was the uh, king that led a revival in Judah. He was the eighth revival in Judah. It was the last revival in Judah. So at the beginning, people are coming to the temple. People are excited about going to the temple, but pretty soon it just became a popular thing, you know? Hey, we're going to the temple today. Meet you at the temple. Oh, the nice robes. Yeah, we're getting all dressed up to go to temple today. Ooh, did you see the nice chariots everybody's driving? Wow, we're doing good. And it wasn't what it was supposed to be. They weren't going there to worship the Lord. They were going there for the building. And so Jeremiah was called by the Lord to tell people, hey, knock it off. He would go out and stand at the gates of the temple and he would, would say, don't say the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. You're so focused on the temple. You're so focused on the outward things. You're missing the whole point. And so, of course, he wasn't very popular. And people didn't like him, and they abused him, and they made fun of him, and eventually he got thrown into prison. There were other kings after Josiah that were very wicked. They went back to idol worship, and Jeremiah got thrown in prison, and he actually got thrown into a pit. He was sinking down in the mud, we read in one of the chapters of Jeremiah. He would write prophecies and send them on a scroll to the king, and the king would cut him up and burn him in the fire. Just no regard for the word of God from this man. So he had a tough time. Now, the thing that I find fascinating is that Jeremiah was ministering for 40 years. 40 years, that's a long ministry, right? And, and there's nothing recorded in the word of God about anybody responding to that. Nobody came to the Lord. Nobody listened to Jeremiah. And after 40 years, you might get a little discouraged, wouldn't you? And, and Jeremiah got discouraged, you know. He, uh, he was probably by man's standards seen as unsuccessful. Anybody that's ministering for 40 years and there's no fruit, you might want to think, eh, maybe they're out of God's will or not walking with the Lord or something like that. He was. He was seen as successful by the Lord because he did exactly what God told him to do. No matter what anybody else said, no matter what anybody else thought, he did what God told him to do, but he did get discouraged. And in Jeremiah chapter 20, he says, I will not make mention nor speak any more in his name. You ever felt like that? You've been out trying to minister to people, tell them about Jesus. Shut up. I don't want to hear about that. I had one woman tell me if I ever mentioned it in her presence again, she would curse me. She was already cursing, so it wasn't going to be a big deal, but don't mention that name anymore. And this is what was happening. And, and imagine, 40 years, people yelling at you, get out of here. How, how much could you take before you said, forget it, I'm done with this, I'm not doing it anymore. Uh, if you have your Bible, Jeremiah 9, verse, um, oh gosh, Jeremiah chapter 9, verse, oh, excuse me, chapter 20, verse 9. There it is up there. So there you go. I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name, but his word was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. I decided I wasn't going to do this anymore, but God had given me a burden for people. God had given me a desire to talk about him to people, and he goes, I decided I wasn't going to do it anymore, but I couldn't. It burned inside of me. I had this burning in my bones. I had to go out and share again. 
That's what I'm talking about when I talk about a burden for evangelism or compassion for evangelism. I'm so close to the Lord. God's been blessing me so much that I can't help but go and tell other people about him. You know how it is. You, you walk into the office, so oh, what's new? What did you do over the weekend? Uh, <laughs> I went to church. Don't start on the Jesus stuff again. Oh, but it was, it was Resurrection Sunday. We had a wonderful service, you know, talked about Jesus dying and being raised again from the dead and paying for our sins. I couldn't, I couldn't stop. I had to tell others. Now, the Apostle Paul had the same kind of burning for souls in his life. Uh, in writing to the Thessalonians, he said, For you remember, brethren, our labor and our travail, for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable to any of you or we would not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. 2 Thessalonians 2.9. Paul literally felt like I owe the gospel to everybody. The Spirit spoke to my heart. I got saved. I found the truth. And, and it's my responsibility now to make sure that everybody else hears. I, I've got, I don't want to owe anybody. I want to make sure my debt is paid to mankind that I go out and I tell everybody. I, I have to give it away. Doesn't matter what you do with it. I just have to tell you. I have to give it to you. So interesting, this word here, travail, is translated toil in the New King James. It means hard work. It means uh, that witnessing is a labor, and it can become weariness, and we become weary with the work. Now, women that have had children are very familiar with this word, toil and travail. Uh, the idea is that the labor uh, that Paul was doing is involved in bringing men and women to a new birth in Christ. And Paul is making that comparison and saying, if you've ever seen a woman in labor, or uh, the women, you know what it's like to be in labor and the, and the pain and the, and the uh, what do I want to say, yelling, crying out, whatever. It hurts, uh, from what I've been told. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he wanted to bring men and women to that personal knowledge, and he said soul winning can be just as hard as giving birth because you are giving birth spiritually. Now, it sometimes seems like we, we view mass evangelism today, and it doesn't look that hard. You get an invitation, you go down to Anaheim, and there's an evangelist speaking. Maybe it's Greg Laurie, maybe it's Franklin Graham or somebody, and, and they come out and they give a simple message, and Hundreds of people come forward and get saved. You know, well, that was no big deal. No, there was a lot of work behind it. There was uh, invitations to churches. There was training for people. There was follow-up with that, you know, making sure people have Bibles and a church to be plugged into. There's a lot of work that goes into it. It's never quite as simple as it, thinks, as it seems. So uh, we need to prepare for that toil, for that labor. There is a war that's going on. There's a lot of work to a crusade, and in a sense, we're in an ongoing crusade, a spiritual battle. We've talked about that a little bit in the last couple of sessions. The enemy does not like our progress, and I mentioned in the very first session that we've been given a command, and there's a lot of illustrations in Scripture about soldiers. We're soldiers of the cross. Ephesians talks about all of our armor and the things like that. But the enemy does not like our progress. And we mentioned before, too, that when we're given a command by our commander, by the captain of our salvation, Jesus Christ, we don't get to pick or choose which ones we like. Go and take that enemy. Go and uh, minister to those people. Lord, the enemy doesn't like it. Of course he doesn't like it. That's why he's the enemy. But we're to go out and we're to minister to those people. Now, it's easy when you're with other believers. It's easy uh, when you have people around you that can encourage you. It's easy when you're a class like this. You can get all gung-ho and go, we're going witnessing tonight. We're going to Coco's right after we leave here or Orange Square, you know. We're going over there and get some ice cream and witness to people. And then a little later on, you know, kind of dies and it's like, I have compassion for this piece of pie. <laughs> I'm really hungry right now. I have compassion for this pizza or something like that. It can change with the flesh. It, it's drawing close to the Lord. So uh, are you going to, if you're alone, if you're not with people, if you're by yourself, are you going to go ahead and witness anyway? 
Let's say the Lord calls you to a foreign field. Are you going to go ahead and witness anyway? Yeah, you've got the ministry you're doing, but are you going to witness to people? Or if you're going to school by yourself, or you're going to work by yourself, or you leave here tonight and you go home and the rest of your family isn't believers, are you going to go ahead and witness to them? Are you going to continue that witness? They uh, are hostile a lot of times. They might get angry with you. They might threaten you. They might beat you. They might threaten to kill you. So there is a war on, and the Lord wants to remind us, you are never alone. You're not going out there by yourself. You're not standing alone. I promise to never leave you or forsake you. You might want to write this down. Deuteronomy 31.6, it says, Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them, for the Lord your God, he's the one who goes with you, and he will not leave you or forsake you. And then, of course, we all know the one in Hebrews 13.5. Let your conduct there be without covetousness. Be content with such as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Can you keep going with the compassion that the Lord want, wants to give you? You can keep going with the compassion and power that the Lord wants to give you. Now, that often comes again by toil, by travail, by prayer. Lots of prayer. And even if you as an evangelist or a witness aren't willing to do the prayer, God has those that are. There are prayer warriors, and I am so thankful for prayer warriors in my life. There are those who are praying for souls night and day on their knees, and they're prepared to suffer with Christ, give up sleep, give up some comfort, in order to bring to birth redemptive purposes in the world. I bring this up because it's an example of what Jesus did and what Paul did too. And maybe some of you are called to be prayer warriors. I sure hope so. We all know the scripture that talks about evangelism. It says, the fields are white for harvest, but the laborers are few. And I remember one of the first times I read that, I thought, yeah, they're white for harvest. We've got to get out there. We've got to start working. We've got to bring in the harvest. And then you read the rest of the verse. It says, but pray the Lord of harvest will add on. So I, I, I needed to stop and pray. I need to seek the Lord. The more I seek the Lord, the more I pray, the more I know I've got to get out there and do the harvest. But I want to do the harvest his way not my way. My way is kind of like the guy that got hauled down the alley a lot of times, right? I, I want to seek the Lord and make sure that the evangelism, that the word of God goes out without any distraction. But these people are, are those that are praying. And, and Paul, again, is referring here to the initial travail he experienced being a part of the process with the Galatian church. Paul felt like he was a parent. You know, these are my spiritual babies, and, and you know how that is. There's travail bringing them into the world. Then there's travail hoping that they learn and that they'll receive the Lord and that they'll walk with the Lord and they'll stay on the right track. Oh, ask any parent about travail when your kid goes the wrong way. Oh, I need to pray more. I need to, to share the word more. I need to, Lord, what do I need to do? So Paul knew the travail that parents know for their children. And uh, they don't want to see him make painful mistakes. I, there's one thing that's fascinating to me as a parent. It's like when my kids got sick, and I'm sure most of you have felt this too. When my kids got sick, it's like, oh, Lord, let me take it. I understand a fever. This little baby doesn't know what's going on. Just, just let me take it. I'll, I'll deal with the pain. Take it away from the baby. And, and the Lord never did. He was training the children, training our children, and they go through things. But uh, Paul travailed in bringing people to Christ. He worked, he prayed, and he cried. And now they're in Christ, and he's working and praying that they would stay on the right road. He felt responsible for his spiritual children. He had a burden for these people, an incredible burden, to witness to them, to encourage them, to strengthen them, and to draw them close to the Lord. Uh, this travail for souls is probably best summed up in Paul's letter to the Romans. And if you have your Bible tonight, I know it's going to be up on the screen, but I want you to open the Word of God because I want you to mark this. I want you to see this. I want you to remember this. It's, it's Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 1. This is an incredible passage. This portion of Scripture reveals God's sovereignty, God's righteousness, and grace to His people, the Jews. And Paul says, I am telling you the truth in Christ. I'm not lying, 
my conscience also bears me witness in the Holy Spirit, then I have great sorrow, or that word could be translated heaviness, and continual grief in my heart, for I wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. What did he just say? I would give up my salvation for my countrymen, for my brothers. I have to admit, I don't quite comprehend that. I'm certainly not where Paul was. I, I don't know that if I've ever really felt like I'm... Uh, I, I could give up my life. I mean, when I had kids, I discovered I could do that for my kids or for somebody significant. But ah, not just anybody and give up my salvation, give up eternity in the presence of God for somebody else, I'm not there. I'll be honest with you, I'm not, I'm not quite there. Like Paul said, I'm not lying. But that's where Paul was, and we can see his passion. And as believers, we can see the example of a man who had a true passion for souls and how he expressed this passion for mankind. It's how much he loved these people. It's how much he cared for his people. From a divine standpoint, this is uh, the sovereign righteousness of God's grace towards the people of Israel. From a human standpoint, we see the nature and passion for souls that Paul had. He begins and he says, I speak the truth. One, one translation renders this, I'm telling you the truth as a Christian. The thought that Paul is expressing here uh, is that your experience with Christ is something that should be inseparable from a passion for souls. I want to be so close to Christ that I have that same heart that he did. Uh, and you're going to want other people to meet him, to know him, and to come into the kingdom. He's saying, Paul is literally saying, no one can be a real Christian without sharing something of the Savior's travail for the lost. To say that unconverted people around us don't mean anything, oh, well, you know, I found out they can find out. Oh, they're on their way to hell. <laughs> that, that shows how shallow our walk with the Lord is. It's not heart knowledge. Uh, it's not something in your heart. It's something in your head. I acknowledge, I know, I understand. The word says I should. And that kind of knowledge puffs up. And when you reach that state of mind, you're just like the scribes and the Pharisees. You're religious. And Jesus spoke of those religious people. He said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel land and sea to win one proselyte or convert, and when he's one, you make him twice the son of hell as yourselves. That's a pretty strong statement. Jesus isn't pulling any punches. A lot of people with witnessing programs that will uh, increase the number of people in your church, all right? Not necessarily bring them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, but we're looking for bodies. We want to fill the seats, okay? And uh, that's prideful. You know, people will go out witnessing and they'll come back and go, so how many did you get? How many got saved? How many prayed with you? Get any new notches in your Bible? You may think I'm joking, but there are people like this. I've seen them. I've been among them. There are certain denominations that put quotas on pastors. Literally, you don't add this many new people to your congregation in a year. Maybe we'll give you two years. Well, then you're not cutting it. You're, you're not doing what you should do for your denomination, and we'll put in a younger man who can handle it. You get sent to a smaller church or taken out of the pulpit completely. That really happens. Paul's saying, I'm telling you the truth. I'm not lying as a Christian. I have compassion for souls. I don't care how big your church is. I want to see people come into the kingdom. And he begins talking about his conscience. And he says, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. This is intimate fellowship with Jesus Christ. It, it always uh, exercises the conscience regarding the lost. The Holy Spirit sees to, it our, sees to it that our heart is like the heart of Jesus. But you've got to spend time with him. You've got to allow him to move. What did Jesus come for? Did he come to make people happy? Ah, you can be happy. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Did he, did he come to make people feel good? He came to serve mankind. He came to pay the price. He came to bring them back into a fellowship relationship with God, the Father, the creator of the universe. And that's 
what he wants us to do. Holy Spirit witnesses to our spirit concerning what's going on in the heart of Christ. And I, I think we need to ask ourselves, why do we fail so many times to have a conscience concerning our fellow man that's going to hell? If you think about it, it doesn't affect us enough, does it? And I'm not, I'm not trying to condemn you. We know that there's no, now therefore no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Don't take this as condemnation. Realize that I'm not pointing the finger. There's always three fingers coming back. I'm talking about myself. There's a lot of things I don't do enough. And the enemy's right on top of it, isn't he? You don't pray enough. You don't read enough. You don't give enough. You don't uh, go out and witness enough. No, I don't. Well, why? Well, it's probably a problem with my conscience. Uh, think about it. It doesn't affect us enough. We can drive home on the freeway and look around and think, man, freeway's pretty clear today. Beautiful day out, having a good time. Or do you look out on the freeway and go, there goes another car full of lost people. There's another car on the highway to hell. There's someone else that needs Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not saying you can't enjoy the beautiful day and a clean freeway, a clear freeway, but what's our heart? Where's the compassion in it? When you go to the mall, do you go in and go, wow, a lot of people shopping here today. Or do you look into their eyes and go, these people are lost. These people need help. These people need salvation. What can I do about that? And, and a lot of these people are going to their godless homes without Christ to spend time with their godless families. And they're going to watch godless TV and read godless magazines and go back to their godless jobs until they die. Well, what am I doing about it? The obvious answer is our fellowship with Christ needs to be closer that we can sense the Holy Spirit's leading and guiding and conviction. That's the opposite of condemnation. Satan, the enemy, condemns. The Holy Spirit of God convicts. He's gentle. He's loving. He nudges us. He urges us. But he doesn't tell us how horrible we are. We already know that. The enemy likes to bring that up. But his experience, Paul's experience, was I want these people to come to Christ. He had continual heaviness or anguish of heart on behalf of the lost. Let's look at these two things. Continual heaviness or, or great heaviness indicates every day that the weight of the cross grew heavier on Paul. Every day I realize that there's those slipping into eternity. Every day I realize there's some people I didn't get to talk to. Oh, I go by a funeral and I wonder if they got saved. I... I I used to go out and walk in cemeteries at night because it was quiet and peaceful. And I liked to read the headstones, but I wondered, did this one really get saved? Uh, is this one going to be resurrected and stand before the throne and, and be lost for eternity? Ah, this is what Paul was feeling. Many are slipping into the kingdom of darkness day by day. Now, that is the normal experience for somebody who generally just got saved, right? I just got saved. I just found Christ. I'm so excited about it. I'm going to go home. I'm going to tell my family. I'm going to tell all my friends. I'm going to tell everybody in my workplace. And then a few days later, after everybody's called you an idiot and a Jesus freak and said, shut up, you're thinking, well, you know, it took me time. It'll probably take them time. And then eventually, well, I found out. Uh, they'll find out. And then eventually, well, I'll just pray for them. And then after a while, it can even become flippant. Yep, they're going to hell in a handbasket. That's their problem. I tried. I warned them. They didn't want to listen. They made fun of me. So I'm not going to talk to them anymore. That's the flesh taking over. And Paul is saying my burden gets heavier and heavier. Sometimes we find it easier to escape into ministry. Well, I don't have time to go witnessing. I'm busy studying the Word of God. I've got to read my Bible. I've gotten complaints from parents. This is fascinating. They come and they tell me, um, our kids say they got saved. And I said, great. And they go, oh, we don't see any difference. I go, what are you talking about? They said, well, they never clean their room. They never talk to us. They go out and hang out with their friends all night. And they come home and they still don't do any chores around the house or anything. And... Well, now they've gotten saved. They still don't clean their room. They still don't talk to us. They still go out and hang out with their friends all night. And then they come home and they still don't do any chores. Now the kids will tell you, yeah, but I'm not out smoking dope anymore or getting drunk. I'm, I'm fellowshipping, we're worshiping. Well, the witness needs to start in Jerusalem. Come back home and share what you've got. Uh, 
You know, I'm, I'm in fellowship. I'm, I'm not getting loaded. I'm worshiping the Lord. Well, so what? The witness hasn't changed. We need to be a witness. We can escape into fellowship. We can escape into Christian music. We can escape into concerts or Christian magazines and television. But the main thing that should be our concern is for men and women. That was the pressure that was on Paul. He wanted to be different and to make a difference. He felt the heaviness from the Spirit of God. So heavy, he said, I sorrow continually. All right, I, I have sorrow and continual grief in my heart. And literally, it brought him to tears. He was crying for people. On one occasion, Paul says, remember that for three years, I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Paul was con so concerned about people that he was coming up to them crying and saying, don't you want what I've got? This is the greatest thing in the world. Why wouldn't you want it? He had that much compassion. He was, he was crying out like that. Somebody once said to me, we were talking about this kind of thing, and they said, can you imagine standing at the great white throne judgment and seeing your mother come up before the Lord? And the Lord says, depart from me. I never knew you. Wouldn't that rip your heart out? Well, that's what's going to happen if somebody doesn't share with them. What are you going to do about it? Paul was crying in front of these people, tears running down his face. I, I'm begging you to hear the truth. I have good news. I hurt for you. My heart aches for you. And Paul wasn't the only one to weep for souls. Jesus himself was in continual sorrow and anguish. We read in Hebrews, he was a man of strong crying and tears. And then we read later, he was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Actually, earlier, Isaiah 53, man of many sorrows. I think it's a sad teaching in our society today that says, well, men shouldn't cry. I was brought up with that. Maybe some of you were too. There were times in my life when I was hurt or I, I wanted to have compassion, but those voices would keep calling back to me, men don't cry, men don't cry. I was so excited when I found out that David cried. Do you know in one portion of the scripture it says, my bed swims in tears. Oh, that's a lot of crying, right? And David was a man if there ever was one, and if David could cry, probably all right for me too. And then I read about Jesus weeping, and I thought, all right, that makes it good. I, I can release all that now. I can cry. I can have compassion. I can have tears that way. And, and when Jesus was crying, you remember it was at Lazarus' funeral. I don't think he was crying because Lazarus was dead. Oh, I'm so sad he died because he's going to be alive again in a few seconds. That's not what he was crying over. He had compassion for Mary and Martha and the, and the things they were suffering. But I think he was really crying because he had told Mary and Martha, you know, I am uh, the resurrection and the life. If any man comes to me, he will have, he'll, he will not buy it, but live forever. Do you believe this? And the people around weren't believing. Their focus was on something else. Don't talk about that right now. We're sad. We came to weep because Lazarus is dead. Well, Lazarus is going to live, and you can too. He was standing there and preaching, and uh, what are you going to do about it? They said, if you'd have gotten here sooner, my brother would have lived. If you'd have done things my way instead of what you want to do, uh, everything would have been all right. Well, it's more than all right by the time he's through. They didn't believe him. He had compassion. The word compassion in the Greek is the word spelunkno, which means literally intestines or guts. Now, the Hebrews believe that the pit of a man's emotions are felt in his stomach. Love, hate, whatever comes from your intestines. We say, I love you with all of my heart. You don't really care about somebody with your cardiac muscle, do you? Where do we really feel emotion? It comes from the guts. The, the, the Greeks say the same thing. Uh, when you're called to speak to a group of people and you're not used to doing that, and you get up, we say, I have butterflies in my stomach, not my heart. My emotions are down there in my stomach, in my intestines, in my guts. So literally, in the Hebrew, I love you with all of my intestines. Try that next Valentine's Day. See how far that goes. <laughs> People who grieve sometimes feel that pain in their intestines, deep down inside. And uh, Jesus of Nazareth had that kind of concern for people. 
He, he was always concerned for others. Do you remember when they came to arrest him in the garden? Was he concerned for himself? No, he said, who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. Good, that's me. Let these guys go. When he was on the cross, who was he concerned for? His mother. John, listen, get over here. I need, he's in anguish, he's in pain. But he said, I need you to take care of my mother. I'm concerned for my mother. I want you to take care of her. He was dying, he was bleeding. And he wanted to make sure his mother was taken care of. But always, in every situation, he had a deep compassion on people who were in need. Rarely thought of himself, always thought of others. He had compassion. So that's something that we need to pray for, yearning like the mother experiences for a child when they go astray or a parent wishing their children were on the right track. He would look upon the multitudes and he was moved. He saw them as a sheep without any shepherd and had compassion on them. That's what the scripture says. So my question for me is, am I that way? Do I look down the streets and say, yep, nice neighborhood? Or do I look down the streets and go, there's some doors I should be knocking on. I can go out with Kevin and give him the Jesus movie and uh, so they can get the word of God, you know? They're going into a Christless eternity. What can I do about it? I can tell them. He wept over cities. Jesus wept over cities. On one occasion, you remember, he cried, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that kills the prophets and stones them that are sent to you, how often I would have gathered you, my children, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, but you would not. Behold, your house is left desolate. So the very thought that the proud, religious, once powerful city of Jerusalem had not discerned the day of their visitation and they were about to be destroyed broke his heart. He's on his way to be crucified, but it broke his heart that the city was going to be destroyed. He could have called down legions of angels. He could have just said, you wicked, evil people, and torn the city to pieces, blown it off the face of the earth, but he didn't do that. And I think history is full of those kinds of illustrations of genuine soul winners that add compassion. One of my favorites is General Booth. He was the founder of the Salvation Army. He said, I wish all my workers could be hung over the pit of hell for 24 hours. He goes, then I think they'd have some compassion. They would understand what's coming in the future and they'd want to do something about it. But Paul was able to say, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. I want to say that too. I want to say it's Christ in me that's leading me to do these things. And surely his outward witness bore testimony that Christ did dwell within him because he was like Christ and had that same compassion. Well, those that sow in tears will reap with joy. And it's a challenge to our hearts as to whether or not we really know anything about travail. Is witnessing a happenstance? I feel like it today or I don't feel like it today. Most, uh, every one of us has gone through those times where we're in the grocery store or somewhere like that and you'll see some person come in and the Spirit of God will speak to your heart and go, witness to them. And we immediately start, you know, rationalize. I got milk in the cart. I got ice cream. It's going to melt. I, I, I can't do that right now. Uh, maybe I'll just get their phone number and call them up later on, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> not, not the same, not the same. I don't, I don't know if I'm up to it, but uh, how many times do we ask God one of my favorite scriptures, he puts our tears into a bottle. Psalm 56, uh, verse 8. Those tears in the bottle are not tears because I made a mistake or tears because I blew it or tears because I'm persecuted. These are tears of compassion for lost souls. How many times have I said, Lord, take my tears and put them in the bottle. I want to have that much compassion. I want to uh, be heartbroken concerning men and women out of Christ. Let's look at verse 3 of Romans 9 again. Paul says the heaviest thing. I wish I could be accursed from Christ for my brethren and kinsmen according to the flesh. As I said, I, I've never met anybody yet that I'm willing to trade my salvation for. And uh, Paul's redemptive passion is at the deepest level here. He's willing to lay down his life just like Christ did. And uh, I didn't know I could lay down my life until I had kids. And... Uh, I give up my salvation? Mm, don't think so. But that's what Paul said he wanted to do. Philippians 3.10 talks about the fellowship of his suffering. 
not suffering for sin, but that deserves punishment, but suffering for service, which causes persecution and sharing in the outward working of God's purpose and redemption. Winning souls is suffering for mankind. Christ praying in the garden, sweat great drops of blood. Father, if there's any other way. He was talking about salvation. This was the way of salvation. Not my will, but yours be done. Suffering for mankind. Paul willing to lay down his life like Christ to adopt the shame. The shame of his people. My brethren, my countrymen. Were these guys his brethren? No, they weren't walking with the Lord. They were Pharisees and Sadducees and Zealots, right? But he identified with these people. We see that Daniel in the Old Testament did that. You remember when they were taken away to Babylon, Babylon could have said, Lord, at least I serve you. The rest of these are heathen dogs. But he didn't. He said, Lord, deal with me and my people. Lord, my brethren, my kinsmen. Uh, he identified with them. Paul's identifying with the people. Romans eleven twenty five talks about blindness in part in Israel. Once these people were recipients of divine glory, they had the covenant of God. They brought us the word of God. And Paul is now realizing they're spiritually blind. And instead of saying, Lord, they were blind. I was blind for three days out on that Damascus road, but now I can see. They should be able to see. No, he was identifying with them. He realizes that his people are boastful. He says they go about to establish their own righteousness. Romans 10, 3. They'd not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. Paul accepts the shame of their pride and arrogance and the hardness of heart. He could have said, I'm a Christian now, not a Jew. But he said instead, I will be a Jew that I might win some Jews to the Lord. Whatever it takes, I want to do whatever it takes. Uh, you'd give up your salvation for these fools, for these jerks? Paul says, yes, yes, I would, because I love them. Uh, they were mean to him. They despised him. They beat him. They stoned him. They tried to kill him. He could have said, I'm not ever going to witness to you anymore. You're mean. I, I hope you do go to hell. But he didn't. He was prepared to adopt their shame. There was a sacrifice. There was a payment to be made for lost souls. And, and uh, I'm not paying for their redemption. Jesus Christ paid for their sin on the cross but I can have a part of the fellowship of Christ's suffering in travail and seeing these come to new birth in Christ. By the way, Paul never could have laid down his life. It would have uh, not been the purpose. It wouldn't have allowed Christ to fulfill his purpose, to buy every soul, to pay for everyone. But it wasn't a casual thing. And if I don't care whether people are going to hell or heaven, then am I truly discerning the heart of Christ? Am I truly hearing the voice of Christ in my life? Paul, I wished myself accursed from Christ. And again, I can't understand this. This is one of the heaviest scriptures in the Bible. Willing to go to hell if his kinsmen in the flesh can be saved. Again, couldn't be fulfilled. It would rob the work of Christ. Christ accomplished this. He bought every soul. But he's speaking by inspiration of the Holy Spirit to show the extent he was willing to go to. And that makes me ask a question again of myself. What kind of sacrifice am I willing to make? A dollar for tracks? Uh, a night a week? An hour a month? What am I willing to sacrifice to see people come into the kingdom? Again, I'm, I'm not condemning anybody. That's between you and God, what, what he wants you to sacrifice. I'm talking about me. What am I willing to sacrifice? Uh, and I read these verses and I do get convicted because I know there's always more to do. But it's between you and the Lord. So I want you to take these scriptures, uh, Romans 9, 1 through 3, and I want you to take Romans 10, 1 through 4, and I, I want you to meditate on them. Our Savior tasted death for every man. I thank the Lord that that debt never has to be repeated. But the aspect of redemptive work... Uh, that can, we can share in, in the outwork of redemptive suffering, every believer can participate in. And I believe without fellowship with Christ on this level, we won't be as effective as we could be as soul winners. We won't become all that God intended us to be. Again, I know that you're here 
or you're watching online because you do want to win souls. And I praise God for that. And it takes time with the Lord. So Paul speaks of the suffering as, as filling up that which is behind the affections of Christ. Well, through this sacrifice of passion, we can uh, anticipate the winning of souls. Concerning the same subject, Paul, Romans 10, 1 says, My heart's desire and prayer for God is, uh, to God is for Israel that they might be saved. And he carried uh, through this work of redemption, uh, the Lord endured the cross, despising the shame for the joy that was set before him. Not just for the joy of doing God's will, but the joy of bringing many with him. I, my prayer is, and I, I've seen it in Scripture, you have too, uh, enter into the joy of your Lord, my good and faithful servant. Isn't that what you want to hear when you get to heaven? Enter into the joy of the Lord, good and faithful servant. I don't want to hear, oh, I see you made it. <laughs> what I really want to hear is, enter into the joy. Who are these people with you? Oh, Lord, these are some of my friends that I introduced to you. And, and maybe some of them have friends they introduce, and they'll be 30 and 60 and 100 fold. I want to do that. I, I want to come in without shame. So uh, I want to close with this story. I had a friend, he's a little boy, he was 10 years old, and he got this burden for evangelism, okay? He wanted to share Christ with others, and he, his neighbor was about the same age, 9 or 10 years old, and he, he loved the Lord so much, his parents went out and bought him a brand new Bible. They didn't get him just a cheap Bible, a paperback Bible. They got one of the leather, you know, concordance, maps, all that other stuff. I don't know if you've been out to, to uh, price a Bible lately. It can be, you know, 70, 80, 100 bucks. And so they bought him a really nice Bible, and he goes to the neighbor kid, and he goes, you need to read the Bible. You need to know Jesus. And the neighbor kid goes, I don't know. I, I don't know if I want to do that. He goes, I will give you my brand new Bible. He loved the Bible but I will give you the brand new Bible. And the kid's like, well, I'm not sure if I have time to do that. And he goes, how about if I paid you to read the Bible? And so the other kid, of course, goes, well, how much? He said, I have $70 in my savings. $70 is a lot of money if you're a 10-year-old. $70 is a lot of money if you're on the mission field or in a third world country. For some of us even here, 70 bucks is a lot of money. How many people would you pay $70 to to read the Bible? How many people would you want to witness to if it cost you 70 bucks every time? But this was this kid's compassion. This was this kid's heart. He wanted to see his friend come to the Lord so desperately that he's willing to give up his new possession. He's willing to give up his life savings to see someone else come to salvation. He was concerned. That's a, that's a 10-year-old. But it was important to have others read the Bible. He had a passion for souls. So my question I've stated, and hopefully it'll be yours, what's my compassion? As you're meditating on Romans 9, 1 through 3, what's your compassion? What's your burden for non-believers? You know what? As you draw close to the Lord, we prayed for power to be a witness. I'm going to ask you to pray for power for a burden to bring others to Christ, okay? Now, before you go, I got some handouts for you and some homework. Yeah, I know it's the last class and I'm not gonna collect the homework. Who knows, I may, next couple of Sundays from now, I'll come up and go, did you do your homework? <laughs> but uh, if you go to the website, the Packing House website, uh, you can uh, click on personal evangelism handouts. Some of you know this. You're gonna see... Uh, quiz for section four, a quiz for section five, tomorrow's study. You're, I threw in a book there by William Booth, the guy I mentioned, Vision for the Lost, and then uh, preparing your testimony. I believe that's one of the most fruitful, easy ways to share with people. Once I was lost, but now I'm found. Here's what happened to me. And uh, people may deny God and may deny Christ, but they can't deny what happened to you. So take the time and go through that kind of thing. Uh, so your homework is to write your personal testimony and then check out the Methods of Evangelism video that's going to be online by tomorrow afternoon. All right, let's all stand together. And let's pray. 
Father, we want to thank you again for the privilege to be able to gather together to seek you, to draw close to you, to learn more about you. Father, I ask that you would give each person here and each person online at home, each person in our congregation, Lord, a burden for, a, for souls, Lord, that they would desire to see other people snatched from the pit of hell and brought into the kingdom of God. Right now, they're enemies and don't even know it, but the incredible thing is once they receive you, they become soldiers of the cross. Lord, we ask that you would speak to our hearts, that you would convict us, not let us listen to condemnation, but that we would seek you, draw close to you, and have the same heart that you did, the heart that Paul had, the heart that Daniel had, the heart that many others have had for you, Lord. I want that heart for you. I want to be a witness, Lord. I want to be an evangelist. Not like Billy Graham or Greg Laurie. I want to be the evangelist you've called me to be. One-on-one -on -one to friends and neighbors and family and people around me. Fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit. Use us mightily for your work and will to be accomplished. And we ask all these things now in Jesus' most holy and precious name. And all of God's people who agreed said, Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you for your patience. And uh, God bless you. I hope you had a wonderful resurrection weekend. Hope you have a wonderful rest of the weekend, the Lord, too. Uh, be praying. There's the group going to Mexico this weekend. Uh, we have 22 people going from the church down there doing two projects. One of them is a painting project. The other one is a, an evangelism project. There are kids down there. One of the local people told me the, the churches down there don't talk about resurrection. Uh, and I, I was thinking mainly one denomination. They said, no, all of them. Nobody talks about resurrection. So if your kids were in the, the Sunday school this Sunday, remember they did a little snack gospel. We got a red piece of licorice for the blood of Christ, a little white marshmallows for your sins are washed as white as snow. And, and uh, Pastor Rick Cornejo is going down there and he's going to present this to a bunch of kids down there in Mexico. Then I'd also like you to be in prayer because there's going to be 56 people from the body here leaving Monday uh, for Israel. Yeah. Uh, we have a heart for God's people and we want to go over there and be a witness for them too. So God bless you. Have a wonderful week in the Lord.